So, yeah, we're going to spend some time talking this evening, Anna and myself, about two collections. Um, one that's been quite recently acquired by the State Library of Victoria in Melbourne, and one that was quite a long time ago acquired by the British Museum in London. So they're both uh, strong in, in books from the 17th century, the Thomason from the British Library, mostly because it was collected at that time, it's a contemporary collection, and for Emerson because it was a collection that reflected the historical interests of its collector, John Emerson. I'm going to start by talking about um, the Thomason collection. And the idea is to familiarize people, introduce people, or re-familiarize people with the, the two collections. They're remarkable in their own right, but it's additionally uh, interesting to consider them alongside each other, which is what we're hoping to do sort of as this uh, progresses and in the, the, the conversation, the discussion, um, after we've talked about the collections individually. Um, so what's with the hands in the, the title? Historical books obviously pass through many and myriad hands. So these collections, both in institutional libraries, are available to a greater or lesser extent to other hands. But what hands and how is something that we're interested in thinking about and talking about. That inevitably leads us to talk to considerations about the challenges around how the collections and books are used. Working in our roles at both these libraries, similarly to all our fellows in, in the profession working at other libraries, the use of rare books is our mission, so to speak. Not that we're intergalactic space heroes, but we're talking about how to demystify these collections, how to facilitate meaningful access, how to convey the messages of past lives in all their varieties and diversity to people now in all of their diversity. Success in this really is the holy grail of our profession. When we look at historical collections, we're always struck by the continuums that um, become apparent to us. What was important then in the 17th century with the collections from Thomason and Emerson is important for us human beings now. Things like getting your word out, um, the battle of ideas, the participation um, in debate, the control of a debate, the use of the means to that debate through printing presses. Um, and we can compare what happened in the 17th century with the use of the printing press, perhaps now to the use of self-publishing in the last uh, century and to social media now. There are some of the things that will probably come out in the conversation towards the end. Looking at lots of these 17th century books, we can be really struck by uh, the perennial human relevance of the words that are used in their, their titles, in bold print on their title pages. So things like um, the appeal, remonstrance, a reply, petition, revelations, truth, accounts and we could go on with all those sorts of words they really kind of capture human interest and, and human kind of um human volition and and desires and those things still say that stay the same so after we've talked about the collections um we are then going to talk about some of the, the kind of things in common and um that will re revolve around three things really collectors and institutions uh, materiality, and then access and outreach. So, has that changed for people? Great, just checking. Um, so, some bibliograph uh, bibliographical facts about Thomason. Um, here's a, a picture, two pictures of the the storage shelves in the basement in St Pancras, the the building of the British British Library in London. The extent of this collection, it comprises around 22,000 tracts or pamphlets in about 2,000 volumes. So there are 4,942 pamphlets broken down and 7,216 news media issues. There's a lot of uh, newspapers, news books, news pamphlets within 
these, these volumes. There are also 97 manuscript items within these volumes as well. And that's often uh, manuscripts that Thomson made himself of printed material that he wasn't able to actually preserve or collect. So some of them might actually be summaries rather than verbatim what were actually appeared on the printed item. The date ranges um, are from 1640 to 1661. Systematically collected it from the 2nd of November in 1640 when the Long Parliament uh, met and he wound the collection up around 23rd of April, which was the coronation of King Charles II. The location of the printing in the material is uh, London. Thomason didn't really collect um, multiple editions or subsequent editions of work. He usually just collected one edition, hopefully and often the first. Um, few were published outside of London. Um, he didn't really have any way of making exhaustive purchases of material printed outside of London. But he did actually collect often London reissues of material that was printed in Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, and Dublin. The genres of text include uh, literature, periodicals, almanacs, petitions, proclamations, something he calls, and it's known as libels or broadsides or large single sheets, prophecies, sermons, trials, poetry. There were plays in amongst his um, collection, but curiously and perhaps uh, a bit too commonly, uh, rather, for the British Museum. Some of the plays were taken out and added to the Garrick collection of plays in the British Museum to supplement them. That's quite a common um, curatorial practice in the, in the past, and we might touch on those sorts of past practices and interventions by custodians in the discussion at the end. Um, but it can catch people by surprise and cause misunderstandings. The way the collection is arranged is chronological, but that's become confused because uh, Thomason decided to have it bound by size. And that was divided into six parts, small quartos, large quartos, folios, octavos, and general acts, and then large volumes of, of the broadsheets that I just mentioned, the libels. There have been depredations, um, as we'll find out in a little while, there was a very, very long journey, a long road that these books had traveled along and there were some depredations and losses along the way, whether that was uh, through accident or through theft, we don't know. Um, but an estimated 145 pamphlets of, of, are missing from the collection. That's around 15 volumes. There was one volume returned from a collection in uh, a Catholic university in Washington. And that was a, a happy return because um, all of the tracks that were in that volume weren't held in, in duplicate in the British Library's collection, British Museum, British Library collection. So that was a very, very happy return. Um, in terms of access and finding aids, there are, uh, Thomason himself kept, a, as you could expect from a, a bookseller or a stationer, he kept a, a manuscript catalog. It's in his hand and several of his assistants' hands. Um, there's also another uh, manuscript catalog, a, a transcription that was made by uh, a later auctioneer, Marmaduke Foster. Um, it uses a chronological method and it uses volume numbers. Uh, um, an, uh, an assist, sorry, not an assistant, just, just demoted Fortescue. One of the keeper of books at the British Museum worked very hard um, producing a, a catalog, a useful catalog of the Thompson collection and that's available in two volumes. He arranged it chronologically and the shelf marks he used uh, alpha prefixed shelf marks beginning with E. That's why whenever you see an E followed by an, uh, a numeric sequence, you know that you're looking at a, um, a Thomason track. But like everything, that's not strictly true because there have been additions towards the end of it. But it's a, it's it's more than likely that you're going to be looking at a Thomason if it's it's E dot number number. Um, Fortescue also um, added an index and 
a subject index, a name index, and also arranged uh, an index of all the news media. So that was very useful. One other thing to say about the bibliographical elements of, of the collection is one of Thomason's interventions, and that was on the title pages. You'll often see uh, manuscript annotations, and that will be his dating. Um, there's confusion often. There's, there's no one system that he used. It can sometimes be uh, the date that he received it. It can sometimes be the date that it was entered at the stationers, um, or it can sometimes be the date that he believed it was, was released um, <clears throat> onto the streets of London. So it's worth um, thinking about what tracts or what pamphlets mean. And um, that might seem like a glib title on that, that, um, that slide. Obviously it's Valentine's evening and so I'm just trying to surround you all with love. Um, but you know, whenever I think of Thomas and I always think lovely, lovely, lovely pamphlets. So we're gonna share some of these. But bibliography has often got a problem, as we all know, with um, its dubious terminology and um, the number of times that you'll be accused of being imprecise happens to us all. So it's, it's worth giving some consideration to what um, a pamphlet can mean. Thomason's understanding of a pamphlet is instructive for us because for Thomason, a pamphlet might be any printed work of quarter size or less, or with single sheets and leaflets or folio size, which reflected contemporary feeling, opinion, or events. And Fortescue is, is cataloger uh, and uh, biographer clarifies this, saying that Thomason's determination to preserve for the use of future generations the mass of fleeting literature, which poured every day from the press, was assuredly possessed in a rare degree of historical prescience and imagination. Nor could any man, nor could any but a man of resolute determination and strength of character have persevered in so arduous a task through 20 eventful, crowded years. So if we need to look at um, the collection, we, we need to look at the collector. So Thomas and the man and the historical context is something that we're going to think about now. How it came to be and how it has come down to us and what's its meaning and its significance. So Thomason was born around about 1602, and he lived until April in 1666, the year of the Great Fire, the year of the plague. So the fire was in September, so perhaps, you know, luckily for him, he didn't live to, 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 to see that. But a very, a life of very, very uh, full of event, um, historical event and, and long ranging historical events. As a stationer, um, he and a bookseller, he was based around St. Uh, Paul's Churchyard at the sign of the Rose and Crown. He had considerable literary and political connections. He was a common council me uh, member for the ward of Farringdon. He's described as an energetic stationer. And in the company, he uh, act as a, uh, acted as an assistant and then as a warden. He undertook business with the continent. He imported books in continental languages, continental imprints. He was culturally savvy. He had a, a keen awareness of business and politics, and he can be said to have stood comfortably and confidently at the center of the exchange of ideas, information, and the arts. And one last thing to add about him is an orientation in this period. He was uh, a Presbyterian. There were many people who were uh, uh, identified as, as Presbyterians in their outlooks. And you can see from the um, woodcut on the title page of the pamphlet on the slide, I mean, I suppose you don't have to be Presbyterian to be shocked by an Anabaptist um, allegedly murdering and beheading their baby, but Presbyterians uh, had a certain outlook. So you always need to bear that in mind when you're looking at how and what he collected. I think beside uh, George Thomason, it's very important that we pay tribute to the trade and to others, all the many other people that were involved in the formation of these collections. 
He had his assistants, as I've said, who co contributed to the manuscript catalog. But they were obviously runners. Um, there were people who went to great lengths to provide Thomason with these with these publications. Um, and there were also subsequent trustees and custodians. Whenever we look at a collection, it's it's particularly important to factor in such things as, as personal, visceral, and political biases and the omissions that can be made. We need to give consideration, and this is something we'll talk to talk about later with, with, um, with John Emerson in mind as well. We need to give consideration to the agency uh, or the authority of the collector, their intention. And George Thomason. Uh, hundreds of years, hundreds of years before this is is no exception. He had a kind of mission statement. Obviously, he had a conscious projection that he wanted his collection to be used for, um, be available for the use of succeeding ages, and that's very important. In his will, which gave us some indication of his wishes, he had appointed trustees his friend, Bishop Thomas Barlow, Thomas Lockie, who was a Bodleian librarian, and John Rushworth, who was a, a writer, historian, uh, a man of letters. And he charged it to these friends to dispose of the tracts for the benefit of his sons, Edward, Henry, and Thomas. In 1675, uh, Thomas Barlow, his friend, was writing about the collection that the use of the collection might be of exceeding benefit to the public, both church and state, were it placed in some safe repository where learned and sober men might have access to, to it and use of it. The fittest place for it, both for use and honour, is the king's, <clears throat> uh, Bodleian's or some public library. For in such places, it might be both safe and useful. So here he is thinking about where his collection, just like John would, where John Emerson would, where, where, where could his collection be safely kept and where could it be used? I think there can sometimes be historical romanticizing perhaps about bibliophiles and book collectors. But when it comes to people in the book trade, as some of us keenly know, there's the reality of economics. Certainly Thomason loved books and printed communications, but economics ruled. What you can see on this slide is, is a sales pitch. And this was actually uh, distributed in 1685. So 20, 20 years after Thomason's death. Um, but it's an indication of the way that the library was being pitched to other people. Um, this image here you can see is in John Backford's collection, the collection that he formed to try and portray the history of printing. And you can see actually there are two, if you look at the, uh, the caption title at the top, you can see two of them and that's because there are two sheets and behind that there's another sheet. So Backford had three copies of these. So that's actually probably, or maybe an indication that they were quite widely circulated. You know, they were, they were really pushing um, pushing this collection. The collection details some of its um, some of its kind of selling points, some of its points of interest. It also kind of gives a, a really interesting personality to the collection in terms of how it was moved from place to place during the civil wars um, and how efforts were ma made to preserve it and keep it together. Um, and that's actually one of the the real kind of um, pleasures that you can see that people have taken with the, the kind of survival of this collection. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm really going to cut short the idea of how or the, the story of how it got to the British Museum because it's quite a long and convoluted one. Um, but it involved being passed down to uh, Samuel Mern, who was uh, the royal bookbinder. Uh, he bound the collection. Thomason had already had it uniformly bound, 
Mayan rebound it. Um, and Mayan's widow, Anne, um, Anne Mayan, she'd, uh, she'd tried to, to sell it unsuccessfully. Um, it went to checks with notes. I say it's a convoluted story. It's kind of one of those kind of quite boring stories in a way. <laughs> it's 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 not boring, but you know, very detailed. Um, it took a hundred years for it to reach um, probably what probably the destination that George Thomason had in mind for this, and that was um, the royal the royal library. It was only ever briefly in the Royal Library because several um, several aristocrats and, and bibliophiles had been involved in the brokering of, of purchasing the collection. Um, it wasn't to be added to the Royal Library, but it actually, uh, George III purchased it and handed it over uh, as a gift to the British Museum. And that's why on the upper covers of the bindings, you'll see gift of uh, G3. Gift of George the Third, and this can be quite confusing because sometimes, and at that time, it became known as the King's Pamphlets. Um, so that can just go to show that collections that have been around for a long time can go through many different kinds of of uh, identities, really, and become known um, by different names from from different perspectives as well. I think that's quite an important important point. Well, what's in the collection? Um, I think there are two broadsheets in the collection that I are my go to kind of visual aids um, and context for, for what's in the collection. This is one and I'll just go to the next one. So we'll spend some time. I mean, I, I'm not sure you can really see too much of the detail but the illustrations are quite telling on here you can see the figures and you can see um the the kind of nomas that they're given and the descriptions um and this kind of portrays the range of thought and belief beliefs that were were in circulation at the time of of thomason's collecting and I've called this Thomas and the Fears because looking at them, it always kind of evokes to me some kind of like catalog of fears. There's this whole kind of, and this is something that we see in press, in print throughout history, this idea of, of a menace, this idea of a threat, this idea of uh, some people that need to be um, kind of, you need to be aware of, of certain people and, and people become demonized. This is something that we can see already happening at this at this point um and this is a great one you know the the catalog of several sects and opinions um the second one here i think is even more telling because it kind of focuses on on kind of working people laborers tradesmen and these are the people who are kind of grasping and developing and running with these ideas. And so you can maybe see from these, the idea of uh, the notion of this kind of, you know, circulation and hysteria of fears. Um, and I use these because I think they're kind of good summaries of the whole collection because all of these dissenting and heret heretical views, along with all the other social and political outlooks, uh, the manifestos of the time, they're all represented in the print through Thomason's collection. And they're there to be investigated in this one kind of uh, one unified corpus of, of books. There are some holes in the collection and there are things, some things that were neglected. Um, for instance, George, Tom George Thomason um, really had a deep hatred of the Quakers and of George Fox, and he used to call, um, he's, he, he marked some of Thomason's, uh, some of George Fox's pamphlets with alias, alias Goose Fox. Um, 
but Thomason knew the value of this sort of material, so he strove uh, to, to collect it. I think what you see um, about Thomason's motivations to collect this material is his understanding of what the pamphlets, like we mentioned earlier, what the pamphlets are. He was collecting the lives that were lived out loud in print. He collected for and with an eye for the historical impact of the printed output and not really for a strict kind of bibliographical record or archive. Thomason's collection wasn't a personal collection either. More lovely, lovely, lovely pamphlets. Um, this collection was something that he did intend to sell. It was something that, as he, as as we've said, as we've we've covered, um, something that he wanted to make available for study and enrichment for future generations, so he could make those projections of of the need and the relevance of this collection. But he had um, had his own collection of books in his will. He bequeathed individual books to people. Who, who he was connected with in, through friendship. And also in his will, this is really quite touching for Valentine's, his wife, Catherine, who had died in 16, um, 1646, I think. His wife was a, a partner, very much a partner, an equal partner in his, 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 his business. She was known to be uh, erudite, and she had her own uh, important library. And he kept that library intact and for the rest of his life. And he passed it on in, in its entirety to, to his children. Um, so I think that that's kind of one of the big differences between John Emerson, the modern collector, and George Thomason, the historical collector. Some of the personal glimpses um, into Thomason's character. I'm really fond of this one. This is something that Fortescue points out, and it's perhaps not something that many people get to see when they think of Thomason, but it wasn't just the dates that he wrote on the title pages. Sometimes he had a little bit of a quip, a uh, witty quip here and there. And you can see that this is um, kind of early version of Vanity Publishing. And we've got uh, Thomas Cheshire, a, a, a minister, a preacher, who's had his very important sermon printed, printed at London for the author, and Thomason's decided to uh, interject with the comment, because none other would. And I think that's kind of quite relevant to a lot of modern day vanity publishing. Um, his wit is could be quite um, acerbic, quite taciturn as well. He was clearly no fan of William Lilly, who is quite a controversial dandy figure. And you can see down the bottom of this title page where William Lilly, a uh, student in astrology, Thomason has, has added in that William Lilly is catamite and student in astrology. And that kind of presents quite a problem to past custodians because past custodians at the British Museum have never been very. Um, confident in, in kind of showing people that kind of material they'd be, even when they refer to it in, in published research, they, they, they wouldn't like to mention the sort of terminology there. But that's, that's really quite historically interesting and important, I think. So if we're thinking of what Fortescue, his main cataloger and biographer, says if we want to think about Thomason's significance and his legacy, Fortescue says, um, of the many donations which have been which have enriched the library since its foundation in 1759, few have been of greater benefit to successive generations of scholars and students than this collection which we owe to the generosity of King George III. Um, I think there are the wide. I'll just kind of finish off with pointing at some of the wider questions of historical context and the meaning and impact of Thomason's collection. 
we have to kind of think about its orientation then. Um, I mentioned that it was at one point regarded as the king's pamphlets. And sometimes different historians have tried to use it as um, by saying that Thomason was motivated to collect it for Charles II or Charles I before him. And he actually, uh, he actually lent one of his pamphlets to Charles I before he fled to the Isle of Wight. Um, but that kind of, not as straightforward as some people who make that argument say. There are also other people who talk about um, how people see the ideas of republicanism and what historians like Christopher Hill would say uh, the explosion of ideas at the time, and that has its critics as well. So this collection really is um, a, a, an opportunity to kind of go over uh, all of those ideas. I think it's uh, the collection is representative of debate and discussion on, and continues to be uh, debate and discussion on some fundamental issues like how we are governed, how we govern, about religious and other freedoms, international relations, our, ex our country's expansion in the wider world. Um, and there's also the idea that the civil wars were never settled at the time and continue to this day. And that's why this collection can be so interesting. So I've gone on considerably longer than I should. So I will hand over to my far more erudite colleague, Dr. Anna Welch. Okay, so I think we could all keep listening for a long time. Very, um, very interesting and already, oh, thank you. So I should probably share my screen though, shouldn't I? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you don't want to read my emails. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, showing for everyone? Yes. Someone give me a thumbs up. I can't quite see. Yes. Thanks, Christian. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you so much, Christian, for well for introducing our talk and and for introducing the Thomason collection, uh, which is such a oh we're not on the sorry we went backwards somehow instead of forward. I'll go forward to John Emerson um, to introducing the Thomason collection and already hinting towards some of the many uh, interesting comparisons and resonances there are with the John Emerson collection. Uh, and I'd just like to say thank you also to, to both Christian and Hazel for inviting me to be part of this seminar. I'm luckily, fortunately for me, I'm in London at the moment, but normally my role is in the Rare Books Collection at the State Library of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia, and that's where the John Emerson Collection lives. So uh, I thought I would, along the same lines as Christian, introduce uh, John as a collector and his collection, and then give you a sort of sense of some of the uh, some of the parameters around the collection in terms of its access and its use by the public, uh, including a, a large research grant project that we have running currently um, about the collection, and which Christian is, is very kindly a member of the steering committee for that project. So um, very first of all, though, I realised I, I should probably just briefly introduce the State Library of Victoria as uh, there's there are people here from, from many different parts of the world, so uh, it, it's not necessarily familiar. The library in Melbourne was founded in 1854 by Redmond Barry, who was a, an Anglo-Irish, uh, Protestant-Irish lawyer who emigrated to the colonies as they were then and became really one of the leading founding figures in Melbourne in that he established the State Library, uh, then known as the Melbourne Public Library, and also the museum and also the first university. So he was a really key figure in establishing um, those kinds of cultural institutions in the new um, colony of um, what became Victoria. Uh, it's really the history of rare books at the State Library is an interesting topic in its own right, because uh, Reverend Barry actually 
had no use for rare books. He was not interested in books and specified that uh, books that shouldn't that books shouldn't be collected solely for their their beauty, their antiquarian value, or their bindings or their illustrations. What he wanted was to create a library that was useful to working people. And his his ethos was his idea of the library was as a university for the people. And because of that, it was one of the first um, libraries founded in the world where you didn't have to apply for a reader's card to gain entry. Anybody could come in, and that's still the case, can come in and use the collection um, without needing to apply for membership or permission. And that was, at the time, really a radical proposition for libraries, and it remains unusual in many parts of the world today. So despite Redmond Barry's best efforts, though, the library did quite quickly begin to collect books that could be, even at the time, were considered rare. And so material built up uh, throughout the whole of the, the rest of the 19th century and into the 20th century, but it really wasn't until uh, the 1960s that the idea of sort of special collections was born in Australia more generally and in the State Library in Melbourne as well. Um, and it's not actually till the early 1980s that the rare book collection uh, as we know it today, was formed, and that was sort of uniting the Australian and the, the international rare books. It's now the leading rare book collection in Australia. I think I don't say that only from a sense of bias that I work there, but it actually is an incredibly strong collection in the Australian context, um, and uh, particularly in, in international material. So uh, when John Emerson's incredible bequest uh, came to us, it was a it was a very significant moment for the library. His his bequest was the the largest, not only for the largest, but the most significant collection of rare books that had ever been donated to the library in its history. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a moment. But to introduce you to to who John was, he was born in Melbourne in 1938, and he's been described by uh, Nicholas Barker as one of the great book collectors of our time. He initially um, moved to Oxford here in the UK to study nuclear physics uh, and that was in the in the 60s. He arrived in 1964. Um, oh sorry, he completed his PhD in 1964 and it was at that time that he began to collect uh, English Civil War pamphlets. And this came about really through a, a sort of chance introduction to the collector Bent Yul Jensen. Uh, it was at a dinner party that uh, Yul Jensen took him to his library to show him some of his Civil War pamphlets and apparently John never went back to the dinner table. That was it. He was just obsessed by this material that he'd never come across before. And he wrote a fantastic uh, article that was published in The Book Collector about this moment in his life. And he wrote that the book seemed to me to take me straight to the heart of the 17th century. I had never seen anything that gave me such a vivid sense of the past. And in another place, he talked about the kind of the thrill and the privilege of handling material that wasn't just about the history, it actually was part of that history. And so for him, as I'm sure for so many of us, the kind of material encounter with the past that a book represents was the motivation, the sort of the spark that began his life as a book collector. And uh, he eventually uh, moved back to Melbourne in the early 1970s, requalified as a lawyer. He was a very, very intelligent man, as you can tell, uh, and became a, an eminent intellectual property lawyer at QC in, in Melbourne. And for the rest of his life, until his death in 2014, he collected material relating to the political events and the upheaval of the English civil wars in the 17th century. Uh, he amassed around five and a half thousand titles that were in 3,000 volumes uh, and it, you know, a diverse range of material. Um, and you can see here on the screen a, a photograph of John, but also of his collection in situ in his home in South Yarra in Melbourne. And a very one of two beautiful bookcases that he had custom made to house his collection. Uh, one of those bookcases came to us at the SLV with the collection and we now have have used it to house his reference collection of books on books. So his rare book collection is no, no longer in the shelf, but uh, other material from John's collection is, which is a, a lovely sense of continuity. And the, these shelves are incredible pieces of furniture. That they're so large that it was quite an operation for them to be removed from this beautiful 
two-story home <laughs> where they were taken apart and, and I think uh, lowered out the windows in order to get them down to the street level. Uh, so the collection, Don's collection, was actually offered in his will to three Melbourne ins institutions and the invitation was put forward to, uh, in a way, to pitch for the collection. And this was, you know, a really uh, a device by a man who understood the many pressures that institutions can come under that sometimes may accept a collection and then not, for various reasons, not hold true to the intentions of the collector for that material. And he made that impossible <laughs> by putting such sort of strict requirements around what was required to receive this collection um, and including establishing the, the, the requisite for a uh, an advisory committee to oversee the, the library's kind of use and management and curatorship of the collection. Uh, the State Library of Victoria was successful in in pitching for the for this collection, and it's a small rare book world in Melbourne, as you can imagine. There were some awkward times over this period of um, probably around six months when the curators from these three institutions, who were all good friends and long-standing colleagues, were sort of not talking about the elephant in the room of the Emerson collection. Um, but in the end, I think everybody feels that it came to the right institution in the sense that. The State Library was best positioned um, regarding book conservation, as we have a dedicated conservation team, but within that, a specialist book conservators, um, we have the highest grade of collection storage standard, and also crucially for John, we have exhibitions. And so what John stated in his will was that he wanted the collection to be kept together, he wanted it to be both preserved in the beautiful condition that he held it in, but also to be made entirely accessible to people. He wanted these books to benefit the people of Victoria, and that phrase comes up again and again, which is a really interesting resonance with uh, what Christian was saying around Thomason's desire for his collection to be safe and useful. And I think that would have really rung true to John as well. That's exactly what he was asking for. And so the ability for an institution like the SLV to house the material, but also to care for it, and make it accessible in ways that uh, mitigate the impact of physical handling, such as digitization strategically and uh, exhibition, was a really powerful sort of um, a powerful uh, aspect of why the collection came to the State Library. Uh, importantly, it also came with a $1.3 million bequest. Um, and the money is to be spent on acquiring books for this collection so that you know, John wanted it to retain its sense of a living and expanding collection. I'm just showing you here what it looks like in our much more sterile but conservation grade <laughs> shelving. Uh, and uh, and we also have a research fellowship that's offered every second year on the Emerson collection. And I'd be really happy to share the, the links, you know, for information about the research fellowship if anyone's keen to learn more. You can find it on the State Library Victoria website as well. <laughs> So the collection, uh, as I said, it's around five and a half thousand titles. It's in its original state in 3,000 volumes. We have probably added around, I, I think, I haven't done a count, but around 200 volumes um, through our purchases and additions to the collection. Importantly, it is kept in the shelf order that John held it in in his home. And this was a, you know, a really interesting kind of challenge for a library that prefers to put everything into Dewey. So not only was this collection kept aside as a formed collection with its own prefix, which is rare M as opposed to rare S, it's for most of our, um, the majority of our rare books collection. Uh, it, it has its own distinct identity through its prefix, but also through its shelf order, which is uh, thematic and also size based, as you can imagine from the organization of shelves uh, like the one you saw from John's phone. Uh, it was really important to John that we kept this material in his order and I think we'll say more about that later but it's a really interesting aspect of this collection moving into a public library into a broader collection but retaining an identity and also retaining the sort of fingerprint of the individual that collected this material. Uh, so in terms of um, scope and genre, there are pamphlets, news sheets, broadsides, there are legal books, poetry plays, devotional literature, sermons, and histories. And there's definitely a focus on the royalist perspective. I think 
it's fair to say that John was on the royalist side of the debate. Uh, so, as I mentioned, it stayed in his shelf order. You can't see them. These photos were taken before the cataloging was completed, but each book has a has a slip in it that has the Emerson uh, shelf number that, from which we can rearrange where it sat on which bookshelf, um, on which shelf, and then which number it was on that shelf. John himself uh, also catalogued his collection. He collated and catalogued it fully. And most of the books have his book plate, but also uh, uh, a, an acquisition number that tells you uh, when exactly when he bought the book. So, for example, the number 804 means that it was the fourth book he bought in 1980. So all that material is there as a way of kind of collating the, uh, you know, understanding the collection both chronologically and uh, the way that John wanted to organise it. Uh, he was also very interested uh, in collection, uh, in, sorry, in collecting the books that had been in other prominent collections. So he collected books that were owned by John Evelyn and by Dan Fleming and others of that period, 17th century collectors. So this, I think, is, is an insight into why it also mattered to him for his collection to stay, uh, to, to retain its shape and to retain his, uh, his fingerprint. And I think it is, an, it, well, it was and is an incredibly generous gift of material that in the normal course of things, one would expect to probably be sold off and split up uh, when a private collector um, passes on or decides to pass their collection on. It's very unusual in the Australian context for this material to come into a, a state library. Uh, so John, John was extraordinarily generous and he wanted people to enjoy the books, as he said, in the same way that he did, uh, but equally had a sense of the importance of the collector as a figure within the collection, a kind of um, invisible invisible presence um, lurking in these shelves, not lurking, that's the wrong word, um, you know, accompanying the reader through the collection. Uh, so then just to think about our access, balancing preservation and conservation, uh, as I said, is the kind of key issue because of course, these are for the most part books in very good condition and many in um, early bindings, if not, contemporary original bindings um, and and John left us with this difficult task of maintaining both the condition and complete access to the books and also not wanting them to be completely digitized and of course there really wouldn't be much point in digitizing a lot of it in the sense that other copies are out there and the strain placed on these individual books is not wouldn't justify doing that um, but it is a it, it is something that makes it you know a challenge for us to to care for the books uh, as well as make them available. So unlike the majority of our rare books collection, which is read in a heritage collections reading room, Emerson books are read by appointment in our staff area. And that's really to give us a chance to, to speak to the user about what their needs are, um, whether they need to see that particular copy, maybe that there's another copy that would suit them, or perhaps they actually just want the text and they can find it elsewhere online. So we go through that sort of uh, reference interview as a way of making sure that the book really does need to be handled. Uh, and uh, then there's also, of course, as I mentioned, there's the research fellowship. So that's an intensive opportunity for people to engage directly with the collection. Uh, and we have annual displays in our, uh, I think I'll put them at the end of the slide, I'll go to them, in our World of the Book exhibition, uh, which is, I'll say more about it when I come to it, but exhibition in general is an important part of the collection. Uh, and I'll say something too about our research project, uh, which is the most recent and kind of exciting, I guess, and innovative uh, method that we're using to open up access to this very special collection. I thought I'd just run through some of the highlights of the collection uh, briefly, um, betraying my interest in book bindings, as quite a lot of them are bindings, but this is a pretty remarkable volume. It's the collected works of James I, but it's the copy that was bound for Charles uh, as the Prince of Wales, and you can see his um, the Prince of Wales feathers there, uh, which is a, a, an extraordinary item and the sort of thing in a way, we didn't, Christian and I didn't talk much about this in our kind of book practice discussions, but there are, there are some items in this collection that, that you think maybe this wouldn't necessarily leave the country today if it came up for sale or auction. 
uh, and there is one major exception I should have said to that of his collection there was one um, item that John sent to the Bodleian Library not to PSLB which was the Travelling Library of Charles I. So he recognised I think that that was something that was a, a you know a sort of treasure, treasure of the nation that that should remain in the UK. Um, but it's interesting what what the line was between you know making deciding that that should go to the Bodleian, but some of this other material should stay in Australia. Uh, the embroidered bindings, there are there are five in the collection. There were four when uh, the collection came to us, and we've subsequently been able to add one through the, the good offices of Robert Harding at Max, um, who had actually uh, sold John the binding you see on the left there, the Richard Hooker, in the 1980s. And uh, he came came upon the binding on the right uh, much more recently and recognised it as being likely the product of the same workshop. And this is very unusual to be able to to be able to identify particular workshops producing embroidered bindings of this kind because generally the the it's impossible to kind of find hallmarks of particular makers as they didn't sign their work. Um, but in this case, this use of the raised silver wire work cartouche and particularly the lion's head motif is very distinctive. And the binding on the left is important uh, in part because it has a pair in the British Library, which I need to come in and see soon, Christian, <laughs> um, which uh, the, 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 cop the book in the British Library is known to have been given as a gift to Henrietta Maria, Charles's queen. And so it is believed that the that this the hooker in the Emerson collection is a pair of that book and was also presented to Henrietta Maria. It's missing its title page and fly leaves, so it's quite possible that the dedicatory poem, such as appears in the British Library copy, is has been sampled <laughs> and removed. But it's an extraordinary binding and exquisite copy, and a really interesting. I mean, this is part of my research interest in the embroidered bindings is thinking about these as presentation copies to the Catholic Queen. That you have texts like you know, hooker on the ecclesiastical polity and the Book of Common Prayer is a very kind of pointed gift to be giving the wife of the head of the Church of England. Uh, so the book on the right we acquired in 2019, you can see how the Emerson number is configured there with our modern, uh, our contemporary binding, we put the year and then the item number um, that it was purchased. These are the three other original embroidered bindings from the collection. On the left, you have a book that was bound in the waistcoat of Charles uh, I with the ribbon of the garter as the ties that are mostly missing now. In the center, I mean, this is the awful thing about digital images. These are not, these books are not all the same size, but I just wanted to make the images as clear as possible. The book in the center is a copy of the Econ Basilica, the, the um, devotional text uh, based on manuscript text written by Charles I that was published shortly after his execution and became such a kind of relic of the royalist cause. Uh, this is a copy that, as you can see, has been embroidered with a portrait of Charles himself holding the book. And then on the right, uh, a copy of Joseph Hall's Meditations and Vows, um, which is in a binding that's very similar to the work of Esther Inglis. So it'd be interesting to try and explore those links further. We also have some lovely, lovely pamphlets in um, Emerson. And uh, I, I said to Christian, the, the Rupert, uh, the Rupert Dog pamphlets are my all-time favourite. <laughs> Can you have a favourite Civil War moment? That's my favourite moment. The uh, the war of words over Rupert and his poodle. Uh, but John John's, in fact, entry point, as I said, to collecting was pamphlets. So he began there, which is an interesting resonance with Thomason as well. Uh, and I, you know, in one way, you can assume he began there because these were affordable items to begin to collect. And he certainly worked his way up from there to a much broader range of interests. Um, he collected pamphlets that were, you know, rebound, had been rebound and he had pamphlets bound as well. But as you can see on the left there, he also collected uh, pamphlets that were in their more or less original condition or which have been extracted from uh, compendiums. Uh, so that particularly you see the narrative of the of the trial there, the second on the left, um, is has its original stab stitching, which is a really beautiful thing to see. And, you know, these are, of course, very moving pamphlets that you can track your way through the whole process against the king and then his eventual death. And this is an extra illustrated edition um, showing Charles on the, 
on the uh, platform outside Whitehall. Uh, there are quite a number of really fascinating broadsides in the collection, and this is a this is one that has been of particular interest to our to the research project. I'll talk about in a moment uh, around Charles and those that were martyred for their adherence to the royalist cause in its black mourning uh, border. And this has recently been subject to some interesting conservation treatment in Melbourne. There's a very non a very non interventionist uh, sort of attitude towards the Emerson collection, but uh, it's been it's been an interesting stimulant of our research project that it's allowed some conservation treatments and exploration to to be undertaken in preparation for digitization. Uh, a couple of my favourites who I just felt like needed to be on a slide together. This is John Donne. So literature and poetry was also uh, is also an aspect of the John Emerson collection. And this is my favourite author portrait of all time. John Donne had this portrait of himself in his shroud made before he died and kept it on his uh, bedside table until he did die. And then it became the, the frontispiece for this <laughs> pamphlet that was published shortly after his death. And on the right, uh, fast just fantastic um, image of uh, uh, that accompanies the mirror which flatters not, which was a, a text uh, dedicated to uh, Charles and Henrietta Maria, um, but which was actually written earlier for Charles, uh, Henrietta's mother, Catherine de' Medici, fabulous uh, skeletal queen there, um, reminding us not to be too vain on Valentine's Day. Uh, and then just a couple of other curiosities. John didn't focus on manuscript material, but he did collect some manuscripts, including two letters in the hand of Charles I, which I couldn't get good images of, so I didn't include them, but they're remarkable. One is a letter to Rupert, Prince Rupert, written from Oxford in 1642, uh, at the time that Oxford was a crucial battleground, and the letter is calling for, him, for Rupert to come and, and help him, and it's from you know, his loving uncle. It's a very personal letter. The other is to Rupert's mother, Elizabeth of Bohemia. Um, this item on the left is certainly not in the hand of a king, but I just find it fascinating. It's a it's a sort of draft frontispiece for a book that was never, as far as we know, never published. And, it, you know, in a very naive style, it's a it's about it's it's probably a little hard to see on the screen, but it, it's essentially mourning the execution of Charles, the death of Charles um, with this amazing bleeding heart. Um, at the top of the of the image, uh, that's a that's a bit of an oddity in, in Emerson's collection, but for that reason, interesting and I thought worth including tonight. And then on the right, um, again, a little bit of anti Valentine's <laughs> spirit here. If you ever wanted to know what to send someone you really don't like in the 17th century, it was a contagious plaster of a plague sore, um, and this was what was sent to John Pym, who was one of the founders of the parliamentary system and it was presumably sent by a royalist uh a royalist um anti-fan <laughs> and there's no image of the plaster saw thankfully but i imagine that is uh is john's face when he opened the envelope <laughs> and then lastly just for a bit of fun there are some interesting kind of curios within the collection that are not the reason john collected them um he has a big collection of philip sydney's arcadia in many different images and this is a copy which happens to have um, some messy paw prints from a feline um, desk buddy of whoever was reading this copy at that time. Uh, so as I mentioned then, uh, just to finish off, we have uh, every year we have two displays within our World of the Book exhibition that focus on the John Emerson collection. This is an exhibition that's been running since 2005, but every year we completely change what's on display. It's uh, around 300 books will be on display every time. So it's a big project and it's in a very beautiful um, gallery within the library, which runs around the fourth floor of our domed reading room, which is still an active reading room. It used to be the book stacks and in the 1990s, it was converted into gallery space. So as you walk around this circle, you get views of the domed reading room uh, periodically. And it's a very, it's a very, special space and particularly lovely space to be reflecting on on the history of the book. So we have Emerson displays each time. This year one of the displays is uh, this is about the kind of familial and dynastic uh, power relationships between Elizabeth I, Mary Queen of Scots and then James I. And then I hope this video is going to work. Where is it? It's not sure. Is it? 
Uh, here it is. I wanted to play this video. This is, I'm just going to let it run while I uh, talk. Um, I mentioned that we have a major research project around the Emerson Collection, and this is a, a project that's funded through an Australian government scheme called the Australian Research Council, and it's called a linkage grant. And what it does is connect uh, researchers with institutions or organisations and the, in, in this case, the SLV uh, puts a certain amount of in-kind funding per year towards a, a three-year research project, and the government matches that in, in sort of dollar funding. So this is a project that uh, involves uh, sort of a, mer a, a merger of digital humanities, digital humanities uh, early modern scholarship, and special collections curatorship. And its intent, I guess, is to kind of uncover um, more about the scope and the contents of the Emerson Collection to promote its international significance and to develop new digital tools that will help us unlock the value of the collection as a public resource um, and result in a kind of uh, a broadening of access to and meaningful engagement with this collection in an Australian but also then in a global context. So the team is composed of Professor Rosalind Smith from the Australian National University, Professor Mitchell Whitelaw, also from ANU, Professor Sarah Ross from Victoria University, Wellington, uh, Associate Professor Patricia Pender from Newcastle University, Professor Paul Saltzman from La Trobe University, and our PhD candidate, Julia Rodwell, and me and our steering committee, as I mentioned, um, which Christian is a member of. So one of the key outcomes of this project, apart from uh, scholarly publications and other sort of more traditional and standard um, works, is a digital exhibition. And by exhibition, we're thinking not only of the sort of display of rare books in a digital realm, but also about collections as data and how to visualize the Emerson in new ways and also how to connect it to collections elsewhere like Thomason to which it's intimately related but which library catalogs can't connect. They, they're not designed to make those kinds of connections. So we're coming up with digital resources we hope that will um, that will invigorate engagement with collections of this kind both for a, a wide public audience, but also for specialists in the various different fields involved. And one of the exciting things we're doing is what you're seeing on the screen is this technique of photogrammetry, applying that to, uh, to the embroidered bindings in the collection. And this is a really, I mean, to me, very exciting way of taking advantage of what the digital can offer us in, in, in the sense of engaging with rare books, uh, which goes beyond what you can do in person. And these are very fragile, items you can't handle them easily um, they're not they're not uh, that sometimes they're very small scale like the one that you're seeing on screen which is the Ifon Basilica with this technology you can capture a digital model of the book that allows you to handle it in an entirely new way not to replace of course the the importance of the original and the engagement with it but to allow you to visualize it in new ways and connect it as I said to material in other collections in new ways so I think I'll I'll get out of that. I'll finish. Uh, how do I go back to oh, I'm screen sharing? Stop share. Uh, oh wait, did we have more we wanted to share? We do. I'll put it. I'll go back, Christian, and put that up again. This one. Uh, back. You. So we thought having sort of outlined for you all the, the scope and the nature of those two collections that, that we'd like to sort of reflect in a more conversational way between, between Christian and I, but also opening the floor to comments and questions and um, input uh, around some of the main themes that, that arise from this, this uh, comparison of these two very different, but <laughs> Uh, very resonant collections. So we've kind of grouped our thoughts under a few different themes of collectors and institutions, materiality and access and outreach. Um, but we may we may wander around a bit between them, seeing as we go how we how we go. So I think one of the first things we thought was that there's these two questions raise some really interesting 
reflections on the difference between a historical collection versus a modern collection of similar material and the different trajectories that they've had over time, what impact it's had for the Thomason collection to be within the British Library for such a long time compared to the Emerson collection arriving very recently and having been in private hands you know, for, for the majority of its, for its existence until now. And we were talking, Christian, about the, the kind of different agency and intent between individual collectors and institutions and their different responsibilities, but also their, yeah, their different motivations. That's right. I think one of, one of the things that, that strikes us immediately about these two collections is the difference in terms of how many hands have been at them you know we, we it's it's uh there's there's kind of recent fresh instruction from from john john emerson about what can be done what he would like to be done with his with his collection um there were some pretty explicit indications from Thomason, but obviously it had gone through, understandably, so many different um, kind of stages of custodianship, mm. you know, private. Um, the fact is, it was at risk frequently from even even from destruction. I mean, uh, obviously, the fact that during times of armed conflict and unrest, um, a collection had to be moved around, moved out of London, moved to secret locations in Surrey, or uh, moved to Oxford, um, and that always involves like the losses from Thomson consequences. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of, you know, I mean, in one way, it's the blindingly obvious that, you know, there's a there's a historical collection and then there's this kind of fresh, you know, kind of a yeah. Johnson's baby powder smelling collection <laughs> <laughs> of, John, of John's. It does have a very nice smell. It's not quite baby powder, but. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, yeah. is there any way you think that maybe um, the way that State Library Victoria will currently and in the future how they will look after curate this collection mm. knowing having knowledge of how other collections like thomason for example mm. have been treated in the past and it's very easy of course for us to sort of look down our noses and at how things have been done in the past i mentioned earlier about plays being taken out mm. uh, playbooks being taken out of thomason and added to garrick's collection i mean it was frequently done it was the utility mm. was providing texts in, in in areas where they were going to be used mm. um is there anything that you can take from yeah oh, absolutely i think one one uh one really significant impact of the emerson collection coming to slv is that it's so unusual i mean most private collections when uh the collector decides to move on or dies and the collection you know is dispersed that that's what happens they're dispersed and of course we have many colleagues here in the book trade who who are familiar with handling those kinds of collections that are you know are scattered across the world perhaps to to different collectors and it was certainly the the case as i understand it, that when, after john had died that there were a number of inquiries to, to colleagues about in the book trade about Ooh, <laughs> where's john's collection going um but i think one thing that it's been very important um, in relation to in a, in Melbourne is establishing the the library's reputation as a place that knows how to look after books, and that sort of sounds a bit funny in one way, but in another, as we know, Christian, in libraries and before collections get to libraries, but once they get into them too, this is the whole sort of issue: is how do you how do you look after them when they're being used heavily? They might need to be rebound uh in different generations there wasn't the same interest in um, provenance or binding as there is today and books that have been you know books that are contemporary to emerson's collection but which are in our main rare book collection do not look like the emerson collection because they have been rebound many many times and i think that 
uh, there has been a perception, I, I, I don't know if it's the same in the UK as in Australia, but a perception that that's what libraries do to books. They they rebind them, they don't know how to look after them, they're not interested properly in, in provenance, in um, bibliographic detail. And I think those criticisms were justified for a long time, but now they're, now they're no longer accurate. And a collection like Emerson being in the State Library is a way for us to show people that we do understand, you know, looking after these kinds of collections. And that um, that's a powerful kind of example to be able to set. And, you know, we take collectors in into the shelves all the time to show them Emerson on, on the shelves, which is a very beautiful spectacle and much more beautiful than the rest of our rare books collection, where, of course, things are rebound or in boxes or bags or other preventative kind of housing, uh, which Emerson isn't. And it was stipulated that it not be put into boxes and bags. I mean, John and his family involved in the advisory committee certainly have a sense of the importance of the aesthetic of the collection as a collection on the shelves and being able to appreciate the, the visual, the look of the collection. Um, I don't mean that at all in a, in a superficial sense, but you know, the, the, the importance of the aesthetics of books. Um, and I think that's, you know, you, you've commented Christian that Thomason sort of, in a way, it's a bit of a struggle to sometimes on the shelves to show for people to see why it's so important, why it matters because of its uniformity. Yeah, there are definite, uh, definite differences there in terms of, um, you know, as people who, whose main kind of function is to provide access and understanding and meaning of these collections, uh, these historical books, it, it can, you know, we don't like giving brick walls or introducing brick walls to people, but if someone's asking for something that's of material interest about a book that's in Thomason's collection, then yeah. it's not going to be a, a, a go because they've, they've been, you know, the, the, there aren't the traces of, of past yeah. readership um, or a kind of, you know, past intimate interactions as what you will find in a collection like John Emerson's. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting as well because talking about the reputation of, of some libraries, how they look after collections, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, if you think of the British Museum, the British Library's collections, there are, there are hundreds of collections which we call named collections. Mm -hmm. and, and these really have come to the national collection through the kind of zeal of individuals who've collected. Mm -hmm. And whether they've been bequested or purchased or whatever, I mean, it's like we really need to um, acknowledge and, and kind of salute the zeal of those people because there are whole parts of historical publishing and printing that would be really, really neglected if we, we didn't have mm -hmm. those collections. I'm thinking of Bernie. I mean, the mm -hmm. British Library would be very impoverished a massive paucity of, of early English newspapers had it not been for Bernie's collection coming to, yeah. to the museum. But, um, I mean, in the early 19th century, so say 50, 50 or 60 years, if that after uh, Thomason's collection had come to the British Museum, there were already people who were readers, uh, writers, historians, who were voicing concerns about how Thomson's books were being treated, how mm -hmm. they were being stored, how they were being used, how they were being neglected. Mm. And that's something that resonates throughout, throughout time, really. And now, I mean, I think if you look at the challenges that come with these sorts of collections, you've spoken about if you have someone, you can do that reference interview in the reading mm -hmm. room with really need this copy yeah, we do similarly at the british library i mean if there's yes. something all of the thomason original thomason uh tracts are restricted access and that means that people have to really kind of give us a bit of a a, a kind of idea of why they need yeah access to that that copy um because there were there were several surrogates all all of which which are pretty crummy um mm -hmm. we're talking about digitization you know, Thomason collection was was filmed 
um, many, many decades ago and is available in black and white kind of you know, images on Ebo that make people want to tear their hair out until they have no hair left. And then they become a seasoned researcher and historian. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it can be really frustrating. Yeah. Um, and fresh digitization would, would be wonderful. Mm. But yeah, there's those brick walls. And so how, how, mm. how, do, we, uh, how do we kind of, with new collections, mm. how do we mediate that? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's always the the challenge and the balanced, balancing act, isn't it, between preservation and access and between allowing, you know, a certain amount of freedom to people versus kind of <laughs> taking a very cautious approach and insisting on the use of the microfilm. And I think we all know probably what that's like, the frustration of being fobbed off with the microfilm. But actually, you want to see the original artifact and you might have questions of it that other people haven't asked and that you won't, that won't even occur to you until you see the original. And I think too, I mean, we're very conscious with Emerson, uh, as I said, it's used in our staff area and that does have a sort of impact that you have to be there with the person while they're using it. But that's not a reason not to let someone come in and sit with a book for a few hours, almost just because they're really interested, you know, because I, I had one student, um, at the end of last year before I came here, uh, who just said they just really wanted to see a 17th century book. They just never had that opportunity before. And they were studying the period at university and just wanted to, to sit with one, <laughs> to sit with a book in person. And of course, I mean, that's what we're there to do is to help those meaningful encounters. And I like I think that we've talked a lot about that word meaningful and what does what is it and how do we <laughs> how do we facilitate it? But it isn't just about being able to read a text online or, you know, look up a, a catalogue record of a book. But and I think particularly in an Australian context, and that's maybe what is particularly pressing about Emerson is how do you make sense, how do you make meaningful sense of a collection about the English Civil Wars uh, on the other side of the world? Um, but there are many ways in which that can happen and you know, I think the fact that we have Charles III on the throne and that Australia is still part of the Commonwealth make the questions that, you know, some of those things that you mentioned earlier around relationships to power, monarchy, um, parliamentary democracy, these are all pressing issues, real issues. And a collection like Emerson is, 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 has, a, has a role to, to play in people's engagement with what, you know, what in the end of the day is, is crucial. It's about our lives and our relationship to power every day. And not to overstate, you know, what looking at some pamphlets in the Emerson can do, but it is, I think that that does the reality of connecting to the material as John himself said, you know, that, that this is actually of part of the history, not just about it. It's not just reading a, a later book about this period. You're actually engaging with the people and the voices um, that, that gave rise to those debates. Um, and the fact, you know, going back to the, the lovely title that you created for us, the, the, that sense of the chain of hands, the many different people that have handled these books and been part of that history through through their interaction with this material. I mean, that's that's what I always come back to in terms of what why why it matters that we provide access in the ways that we can, which includes in person access, but also includes, I think, the kind of interpretative work that we can do through exhibitions and research projects and talks like this, um, where we have a chance to kind of come together and connect the dots between material on opposite sides of the world. Exactly that, yes, Anna. I mean, just to, to say something um, about that in terms of, we can see how materiality mm. and access and outreach are all, all intertwined because, um, you know, whose hands we want more hands, mm. but what are those hands? Are mm. they hands and eyes on physical or digital items? But these, these things, as we've said, are connected to, to more people than just the few people, privileged people mm. who tend to have historically had certainly physical access to these items. But I think mm -hmm. in our roles and the challenges, we're not saying that we need to 
toss these physical books around to people, say, have a read of this, but there are ways and means of us being able to popularize the content and meaning, um, the stories, the narratives, the absolute kind of stretch of every kind of aspect of human life that is con that are contained in 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 print, and certainly in the Thomson collection, is you know it's it's encyclopedic, it's mm -hmm. all embracing, it's it's people's lives, With and and also, time. sorry. I was just going to say also their relationship to media. I think that's something that's been really interesting in talking to you, preparing for this and, and reflecting on all of this. But as you said at the outset, the kind of um, comparison between pamphleteering and self-publishing today or social media, or, you know, any form of kind of putting your voice out there in the media today. I think that these collections have so much to um, to enrich us regarding that the sort of history of our negotiation of media and uh, self-representation, but also um, representation by others and characterization or, or characterization or mischaracterization by by others and and the kind of nature of political debate, which you know I would say is in a pretty sorry state in most parts of the world today. That uh, you know there's something to be said for kind of examining the history of um, polemics and extremism and and you know these these collections tell that story as well the kind of the broad spectrum of opinions and debates and um violent disagreement between people it's it's really good anna to see um the the digital representations and the digital play that's being made with the emerson material mm -hmm. uh and you know that's kind of what what lots of organizations are hoping to do with all kinds of, of parts of their collections mm -hmm. and so exciting to see the uh photogram photogrammetry, photogrammetry. photogrammetry uh imaging yeah. and i don't know if people can see the slide that's on at the moment um but this is just something that i've felt personally quite and professionally quite excited and and pleased about with uses of the Thomason tracks and uh, and collections beside Thomason's from from the the seventeenth century, and this is an image from a gallery in Tate Britain, uh, in in London, and this has been done in collaboration with. Um, I mean, all of these images are from from British Library um, holdings, and it's been done in collaboration with. Um, an artist, Nils Norman, who's based in Germany and Holland. And the idea was to try and kind of provide more of a kind of, more of a, a well, you can see uh, on that slide there, the catalog uh, of opinions that I was uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. using to say that, that this kind of portrays the, the breadth and uh, content of, of this 20 odd years of, of printing. And the idea is to sort of show that there's more to this period than just the individual personalities, this, this kind of top down history. And when, when we were working with Nils um, for this project, the thing that immediately came to mind was the National Portrait Gallery, their Stuart room, which really is the Stuart's room because there is, you know all the portraits in there all right necessarily no you know most of the people who are going to have their portraits done are are from a, a particular uh background but even given that there was a period where um there were anti-monarchical uh, monarchical uh figures it's overwhelmingly just pictures and depictions of the Stuarts mm. and their allies and supporters. And that doesn't really portray for us um, how things were at the time. And that's mm. why kind of a deep mining of the text for their stories is where we can we can kind of that's how we can connect these things to to people's lives now. Mm. Um, and these, you know, I mean, it's the visuals of these that can can be helpful and strike strike people as well. Mm. Um, 
So I just wanted to mention this because I, I, I was this is only just being uh, unveiled in Tate Britain. So, you know, and yeah, arguably how many people get along to Tate Britain, but it's a start and it's it's an example of how yeah. we can try and, and make this kind of period and material and all its ideas and energy connect with people because they still have those ideas and energies there. Mm. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really fantastic. It just even just sort of on a, um, aesthetically and materially to be able to see different to be able to see that material alongside the portraits, the paintings gives you so such a richer sense of the time that you're that these people are alive in. You know that it's you can admire the paintings you know on their sort of merits as artworks, but in terms of this, the the lives of the people depicted in them. The, 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 the presence of this other kind of material around them is really, I, I think it's really very cool, very exciting. And I guess in, uh, in a sense, that's also what we're hoping with this Emerson project, um, which I can also share the link. We have a website, project page website. I can send that to you, Hazel, afterwards. And if people are interested to follow along, uh, that, that we can find ways of harnessing the power of the digital you know, so digital can't ever make up for the lack of the aura <laughs> of the original. We know that, but it can do other things that the that are really difficult to achieve in person. You know, in terms of connecting material to disparate elements that are elsewhere in the world or even elsewhere in Melbourne. I mean, for instance, there's a really beautiful uh, embroidered uh, panel. It's been described as a cushion cover, but it isn't necessarily. But it's a portrait of Charles and Henrietta Maria. Uh, from exactly that period and it has so much in common with these beautiful embroidered book bindings that are down the road in the State Library of Victoria but I guarantee you it would be a nightmare of epic proportions to try and unite them in person in an exhibition in Melbourne but we can connect we can make people aware of these connections um, and particularly when it comes to fragile material like that too I think that there is as we've been saying in terms of our role as curators and custodians of this material for the time being. Our, our purpose is to hand it on to the next generation. Um, and we have to do what we can to make sure that it survives in good condition, which does include reducing access and you know not exhibiting material. So it's about what we don't do as well as what we do yeah. do. Well you've got you've got Mad Max to come yet, yeah, haven't you? Oh absolutely. It's yeah, it's all going downhill in Australia. Don't don't worry about you gotta, that. You've got to prepare for Mad Max. Just, 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 just to 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 to, to uh, go back to the the strengths of the digital. Um, one of the wonderful things about this seminar, and thank you so much, both both of you, both Anna and Christian, for for a fantastic outline of uh, of the Thomason and, and Emerson collections. One of the strengths of the digital is that we can unite book collectors, booksellers, yeah. and librarians all around the world in this in this talk. Um, I'm just conscious that were we in a room, people would be able to put their hands up. Yes. Uh, and ask some questions um, but we do have both the chat and the Q&A facility um, so please do put something in if, if you if you have something to say um, I, I've just seen um, the, the first from Julianne Simpson is that there there may be some um, interesting comparisons with the Crawford English tracks collection at the NLS which was mostly put together in the 19th century right I don't I don't know that collection um, except in name I don't have Christian have you had interactions with it thank you julianne <laughs> yeah i think um this is this is kind of indicative of what what's possible now i mean you know what what used to be um connected and unified in very you know historical monographs a few decades ago can now be connected through the web um and the fact that there are there are initiatives in in the uk there's something called towards a national collection and that's trying to sort of kind of piece together all of these dispersed um all of this dispersed historical material uh, whether that's ballads or or whether it's newspapers news media or, or print in general and and that's one of the potentials that we have uh, mm. And everything's down to resource about mm. really bringing those things together. But the digital capabilities mm. with with IIIF, the fact that we can compare copies alongside each other 
multiple yeah. copies yeah. that someone can do that anywhere around the world that's uh that's 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 kind of the stuff that's on our desk now yeah. and in the future well and also kind of on a just on a human level i mean the only reason i'm here is that christian and i became friends through instagram because we both post about rare books on instagram that's how we that's how we connected many many years ago now um <laughs> But the, the power of the network in that way is so enhanced by the digital that, you know, we're able to have these conversations in part only because of it, <laughs> that, you know, that the, the, the route, particularly particularly from Australia, is a long one to to come to the UK or to anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere and kind of connect to people. Uh, and the digital has opened up so many more avenues of communication for us all. Um, which you know for a collection like Emerson is so important because it, it 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 can't stand alone within Australia that's not making the most of its potential um, do you um do we have any more questions um to give people a bit of time I'll actually ask a quick one if, if I may myself which which was um Given to Anna really particularly that um Emerson was collecting at a time where and Yul Jensen was collecting and uh, Robert Peary was collecting. Mm. Did, did he uh, sort of ever come into collecting conflict with some of his rival <laughs> collectors in the same period? I think he did with Peary. I don't think so much with <laughs> Ben Yul Jensen because they were, he was, Yul Jensen was really his mentor in the world of book collecting. And it's actually very, I find it very moving. I wish I'd included a slide that John based his book plate on Ben's book plate. It's, it's the same design, just with his name instead of Ben's, which is really beautiful. And he did he did acquire works that Ben had had. So there's there's that connection in his collection. Um, Piri, I think more of a, <laughs> maybe more of a rivalry, uh, maybe as they were kind of contemporaries, I suppose. Um, and certainly, when the Piri collection came up for sale, we we pounced on we pounced on a few things um, in order to be able to represent that relationship, apart from the, the items themselves. But uh, yes, I, it, I think he was one of a handful of collectors, maybe even less than a handful, who were focusing on that material at the same time. And and that's also an interesting, I guess, question for the future of this type of material: is are there younger collectors? coming through who are also focusing on this sort of material or or not <laughs> um yeah will there be another emerson collection in 50 years time that's we won't be here to find out <laughs> our successors who are excavating this digital artifact will be able to answer that question for us um, I also had a question, if that's okay, just to, yeah, and just in case, um, I, I'm sure people are aware because they're familiar with Zoom, but um, it's the Q&A, there's a Q&A sort of symbol in your bottom sidebar, so do do put any questions there. Um, but I had a question, just talk, just it's sort of particularly pertaining to um, Emerson, I think we had these lovely glimpses of how, of Thomason's kind of intervention, occasional sort of quite acerbic intervention, um, mm -hmm his collection and I was wondering if there were any not I think sort of notes and annotation in the 20th century is very different to yeah near contemporary um notes but I was wondering about Emerson's sort of intervention in my speech whether it's leaving marks or um re, re not rebinding but repair mm. or um and and also attached to that sorry this is one of those sprawling questions of <laughs> uh, any provision that he he if he made any provision for kind of wear and use i know that you said that boxes and things weren't really he mm. wanted them to kind of out and on shelves but yeah that's a big jumble but um, mm, no 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 it's all it's all <laughs> tied together uh, so he didn't he didn't he certainly didn't annotate in the way that thomason did um mm. but he did put his his acquisition number in in the books and his book plate so those are the two really the only two interventions he would have made yeah. physically to the books there are some that he had rebound but i i i'm probably kind of um off Kind of off script in a way but my sense is that he only did that when he needed to he didn't have things okay. rebound 
for the sake of it. It was only if something was in peril in some way and needed sure. that treatment. Sure. And yeah. I think, I think you know, the embroidered bindings are probably the ones that were the most of sensitive course. to that to needing treatment. Um, but I'm not aware that he had much done to them. I think. I suppose another thing I should have said by way of introducing the collection is that he did. He was he was a very private person, and although he we knew him at the library, and he came along to all the sort of book collectors events, and um, we'd see him at the rare book fair, and he'd come to events at the library. Uh, but he infrequently invited people to the collection. Not not never. He did invite people to see it, but oh. not regularly. So he, it was quite a private, which makes his donation of it to the library even more kind of amazing in some ways that. It was really, he was the only one handling those books and he had a little chamois cloth and he would hold the book. He would barely open them in order to read them. He was very, very careful wow. of okay. their condition. Um, so it does make it kind of surprising that he didn't really make any specifications about that in in writing anyway, around the collection. But I mean, our approach is, and I, I saw in the participant list, our senior book conservator is here with us, Katrina Ben, who, uh, is is the expert on this aspect of the collection, but only only when there's only been one or two occasions where we've realised something uh, either needed it to begin with or has become such that it needs some some treatment. But it's pretty few and far between those instances yeah. because John John collected good copies and he would keep buying to get a better copy and he never got rid of things. So there are multiple copies of the same title because there were different reasons for acquiring acquiring. Um, I, yeah, I was actually going to ask, but figured that another strand to that question probably mm. wouldn't, it would have been too much, but I was going to ask about <laughs> duplicates and duplication because yes. you know, it sounds like he was careful not to. It was sort of one copy he, off in the first, but yeah. Uh, yes, that's right. But he did, if there was a reason to acquire another copy, if a better one came along, he would acquire it and keep the original. And he was certainly very interested in acquiring editions. You know, there's all the editions of the Mel uh, Anatomy of Melancholy and yeah. Sydney's Arcadia. And so that, that sort of serialization of multiple copies so that you can trace that bibliographic history was, was something he was definitely interested in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just to say on that, we've, uh, we've just very recently started adding uh, Emerson's copies to the yeah. English short title catalogue which obviously will make them yeah. much more discoverable so in terms of their relation to other holdings around libraries yeah. around the world. Um, but one of the things that struck me is, is the number of duplicate copies in there. And that's, mm. that's really, really interesting because like Anna has just said, that's someone who's striving for different, um, yeah. you know, I mean, we always hear this comment, don't we, from the trade condition is king. Um, mm. And that's proof. That's massive proof because I think, I've seen one, I think I've seen one instance of six, six mm. copies of something in his collection. Yeah. Um, so that's, 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 I think that's really great. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're there in Australia, they're there mm. and they can be compared. And that's kind of, you know, one of the things that, one of the key things that people want to do. Yeah. That's, that's a really good touch from, from, from his collecting perspective, I think. Yeah. Well, it speaks, it sounds like it speaks a lot to, the reasons what well his idea of how the collection would be used rather than mm -hmm. many collectors who would just sort of trade up as it were yeah cherry pick the best copy and then, yeah and then yeah. Sell, sell yeah the original the earlier no copy. I mean actually probably probably you and your colleagues at Max could could tell me but I don't know if John ever sold sold off works from his collection I, I'm not aware of it he, maybe but no I don't know certainly I, I'm not sure I'd have to I'd have to yeah. ask ask colleagues but that's another yeah. research that's a research fellowship um <laughs> <laughs> topic down the line I, I don't I don't think anyone could sell anything that they'd held in in Shami yeah. <laughs> you're right you're right each, each one show. would be special that's very I'm, um, true. I'm, I'm, I'm just conscious of, of time passing. Um, we've got two more questions, which I'll which I'll read out. Um, the first one is from Genevieve McNutt. Um, he thanks thanks you both for the wonderful talk, and asks: Are there surviving records of readers or users of these collections? Things like registers of readers' requests that could be used to see what was or not of interest to scholars at different times. Oh, 
Well, I guess from from Thomason, um, the the kind of general answer is besides the last two decades, no, because the library now has a, a an automated book request system uh, which records the use, uh, the issuing of books from storage, whether that's for a reader, whether that's for a, a, a library worker, or whether that's uh, for imaging, for, for a commercial order. Um, but that's only for the last 20 years. There's lots, and I'm very interested in have been doing something along these lines recently, trying to gauge the usage of the, the collections, especially like Thomason. Um, but before that, really, no. I mean, the, the amount of record keeping in an institution the size of the British Museum and the British Library has never been possible. There are examples of request slips kept at different times um, in the, corp the British Museum's British Library corporate archive. It's not systematic. So really, um, there's, there are possibilities. If, if someone wanted to research this, there were possibilities, but it would be little snapshots. Mm. Um, and I'm not really confident confident at the moment to advise on on how, um, how you know how much you could tell from that. But it's, that that would be brilliant to do, really mm. good to do. Researching the archives of the British Museum for for usage um is is mm. is a is a great idea and, and there are records so don't don't be put off by that there are make inquiries i think yeah i was there, something came up about this um because i'm i'm in the prints and drawings department at the british museum at the moment um with this scholarship and there was a really interesting list shared by a researcher of uh mid 20 uh, first half of the 20th century artists who had use the prints and drawings collection not not we don't know what they use but just that they'd come in and I mean it's the same sort of thing where for the library you could see who was using the library at certain times but I mean it's really interesting in Australia it's it's kind of the opposite in the sense that because of privacy laws there's no tracking of who's using what in the collections we we know we know as people are using them but the information is not retained um, beyond a certain period because of privacy. So it's a, going to be a real, real bummer for <laughs> researchers of the future that because of our um, extremely strict privacy laws, we have, we're not going to have that information recorded who was looking at what um, in things like Emerson. Um, can, I, can I just say it's a real shame that the identity of that cat hasn't been recorded. <laughs> can I tell you, can I tell you that there were efforts made to identify the cat. We actually had a really interesting session with a biologist at La Trobe University who is doing work that involves being able to test, you know, um, uh, biological material to then identify the species of the animal. And there were there were high hopes at one point that could could there be some feline 16th, 17th century DNA embedded in the page, but we haven't got anywhere yet. <laughs> we'll just we'll just brilliant. Remember, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Um to, to, talking of uh of, of, of animal, uh th th there's a certain type uh of of um a sort of what what's the best way of putting it? Um I think. I suspect Hazel and I are slightly more familiar with uh, the book collecting side of uh, of these seminars uh, and 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 the, and the trade side as well. And the final question, I don't think we had any more, so I think we'll say this is the final question, um, is is from Andrew Nadell, um, who says there are a number of serious collectors of early books in many Western countries. The question is really whether there are any such collectors under the age of forty. Um, there are many, there are very few winners of the University Book Collecting Prize in the UK and the US who collect books before 1800. Many collect the currently popular subjects and many collect late 20th and 21st century. There may not be a solution to this problem. Um, I, I'm wondering what Hazel thinks, but I will just say firstly that um, I was sat in an auction room uh, in the uh, in the town where, where of the university where Hazel and I went just a week ago. And uh, not only was I not the youngest person in the auction room, which was a nice change, I was one of the older people in the auction room. I'd say there were there were about sixty percent of the people in that auction room as book book sale um, were under thirty, 
and uh, an awful lot of them were buying early books and manuscripts, which I thought was really heartening. Mm. Mm. I think um, uh, I I would say that I do see I don't know I do see sort of younger collectors. I think I think means has much to do with it. Frankly, I think it's I think um, I don't know if it's necessarily that people under if there's a I don't know it's necessarily people under the age of 40 are more <laughs> interested in sort of late 20th and 21st century it might just be that actually at this sort of age and stage it, it, I can't afford of, yeah. yeah pre-1800 yeah. um uh books are are just mm. harder to find at sort of a, a kind of affordable as it were um but I also I've also been heartened sitting in sitting in um uh sitting in auction rooms and also seeing um younger people coming around who are interested in pursuing careers in the in mm. the in the trade and and as librarians interest is not just shown by purchasing it's also kind of shown by wanting to work with with that sort of material so I think and then they see the wages I was going to say, <laughs> working for salaries that mean you can't be. I wanted to, oh, I can't remember at what point I wanted to say something about this earlier, but I mean, there are there are catalogues, there are pre-1800 um, printed items that are available, you know, interesting items that are available for a couple of hundred quid. And I, I you know, I know very very well that 200 quid is mostly what people most people can't afford mm. so let's not kid ourselves about that mm. but i think um that is if i think about 200 pound for something that was printed in 17th century i think well you know actually i i'd i'd save to get mm. one of those but you wouldn't be able to form some kind of um, quantitative collection, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly certainly true in the Australian context, and I'm sure more broadly than that, that most major collectors are wealthy men um, who have disposable income. And so there's a kind of gendered aspect to it as well, historically at least. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> We have um, we have a, a final message um, from from Lo Lois McKevy in Melbourne, who says, "Thanks, Anna and Christian. So glad I rose early. Um, it's oh. been so so wonderful to hear um, about these collections. I'd, I've known of the Thomason collection for a long time, but I've never actually seen the stacks. So for me, that 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 photo was fantastic. So um, thank you for that. I also happened to be the other day in Tate Britain and saw um, oh. all that hanging. So that so that that was lovely to see Brilliant. that." that are referenced as well um thank thank you all so much thank you to everybody who's attended as well um we've had really good retention we usually lose about half our participants halfway through uh, <laughs> and uh it's people have only just started going off to dinner uh if they're if they're in england uh in, in the last couple of minutes so um thank you all so much